how black male slaves were sexually exploited and raped by their white women owners remains hidden today. It's because even if the white supremacists wanted the accounts of sexual exploitation of black women to surface, they didn't want everyone to know how white women used their black male slaves as a lustful plaything, how they took black male slaves to their homes. Secretly, to hiding from their husbands would certainly raise questions. If this is known by a majority of the people, it will hurt the ego of white supremacists, challenging their wives' loyalty and eventually embarrassing them. Yet white women slave owners did not only sexually abuse black male slaves, but took the exploitation to another level, which you will know in this video. Let's get started. The Black History Archives Despite societal expectations of femininity, white women in the planter class held significant power within the context of slavery. These women actively participated in maintaining and perpetuating the institution, wielding authority over slaves, especially black male slaves. It's worth noting that, in the American South before the Civil War, white women couldn't vote or hold office. When they married, their property technically belonged to their husbands. However, they shared one significant capability with white men. They could buy, sell, and own enslaved people. In her book, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, historian Stephanie Jones Rogers argues that white women were far from passive bystanders in the business of slavery, contrary to previous historical narratives. Rather, they were active participants, bolstering their economic power through the ownership of black slaves. Jones Rogers drew on a different source for her research, relying on interviews with formerly enslaved people conducted during the Great Depression as part of the Federal Writers Project, an arm of the Works Progress Administration. These interviews reveal that white girls were often raised to be slave owners, receiving training and discipline and mastery from a young age. Slaveholding parents and family members would provide black slaves as gifts to these young girls on occasions like Christmas or when they turned 16 or 21. There are even accounts of white female infants receiving enslaved people as their own property. One particular instance stands out in court records, where a woman discusses how her grandfather gave her a black slave when she was just nine months old. How could a child understand that she had a slave if she hadn't been taught? Clearly, she was schooled in the idea that she had authority over another human being as her property. This early indoctrination led these children to grow up without recognizing black slaves as fellow human beings. Such upbringing contributed significantly to the creation of deeply racist and supremacist mindsets within society. One of the most disturbing aspects of the abuse endured by black male slaves at the hands of elite white women was sexual exploitation. While the prevailing narrative often portrays white women as passive or innocent. There were instances where they actively engaged in non-consensual sexual relationships and rape, leveraging their power and control over black male slaves. These actions perpetuated a cycle of sexual violence and degradation, further dehumanizing those who were already enslaved. One example of such cases can be found in the autobiography instance in the life of a slave girl by author Harriet Jacobs, who, once a slave herself, described how planters' daughters would take advantage of male slaves. Perhaps the fathers and the male relatives of the white girls did not know that giving them black male slaves would lead to the exploitative equality of what they were doing. In other words, as white men were raping and sexually exploiting black women, so could elite white women rape and abuse black male slaves. Even though both sexual exploitations were inhumane, unethical, and haunting, White men took pride in raping black women. However, they could not take pride in knowing that their white wives, daughters and sisters, were establishing sexual relationships with black male slaves. Something should be noted here. Sexual relationships between black male slaves and white elite women did not mean a two-way consent. Black male slaves were forced to do whatever was ordered. Otherwise, they were brutally beaten and sometimes murdered. Hence, Getting sexually exploited seemed a better option than being killed. Harriet Jacobs wrote in her book that she witnessed a master whose reputation was marred because his daughter had chosen one of the most abused male slaves on his plantation to father her first grandchild. Something should be noted here. The daughter did not choose a white man or her father's more intelligent servants. Instead, she selected the most brutalized black male slave over whom her authority could be exercised with less fear of exposure. 
The relationship described here clearly exhibits sexually predatory behavior and can hardly be classified as consensual. In fact, it constitutes a form of sexual abuse, if not outright rape. Mutation mistresses and elite women, like their male counterparts, were able to exert sexual control and abuse over their black slaves. Another method through which planter class white women exercised sexual control over slaves was by threatening to accuse them of rape or attempted rape if they refused sexual relationships. This tactic tapped into the deeply ingrained patriarchal notion that they were weak and in need of white male protection and by extension, control and domination by white men. This allowed them to exert racial control over black male slaves. Regarding the possible causes of sexual exploitation, it likely varied by situation. Some women may have engaged in such behavior due to boredom or sexual frustration. While for others, it might have been a subconscious means of compensating for their lack of power in other aspects of their lives. Planner class white women were essentially the property of their husbands and had limited sexual agency relative to men. Exploiting slaves might have given them a sense of power and control that they lacked elsewhere. Here's a reminder to please support us so we can make more videos for you by subscribing to our channel and giving the video a like. We want to build a strong community and we need your support. Let's continue now. This analysis does not excuse the actions of sexually abusive white women or suggest that female sexual abuse of black slave men wouldn't have occurred if women had higher status in society. However, just as slave-owning white women often vented their frustrations on slaves through excessive cruelty and violence, they probably used sex as another means of domination and control in a society where they held relatively little power. The lives of these women were profoundly restricted. Their freedom and mobility were severely limited. They were not allowed to travel without a male chaperone, and spousal abuse was often considered an acceptable method for men to control their wives in the antebellum era. Many plantation women were unhappy with their lack of freedom and the expectation that they remained dutiful, obedient, pleasant, and cheerful while their husbands had affairs with or rape black women slaves. This added to their sense of isolation and powerlessness, making them, in some ways, prisoners in disguise within a society that championed the superiority of their civilization, but often left them lonely and disheartened. Yet, sexual abuse was not the only one. Physical abuse took on various horrifying forms during the era of African-American enslavement. This brutal oppression was extensive, spanning from small farms to sprawling plantations from urban centers to rural fields, and even within the industrial and transportation sectors. Within this grim framework, both black and white people coexisted, their interactions taking on many different forms. Shockingly, physical violence wasn't confined solely to white male slaveholders. White women were also complicit in committing acts of cruelty against black male slaves. These acts ranged from floggings and beatings to other forms of corporal punishment leaving unforgettable physical and psychological scars. One chilling example that highlights the extreme depths to which physical abuse could descend involved none other than Madame Marie Delphine Lalaurie. She mercilessly tortured her black male slaves, subjecting them to unspeakable horrors such as gouging out their eyes, punching holes in their skulls, and allowing larvae to infest these gruesome wounds. If you doubt the integrity of this account, be prepared for even more shocking details about this 18th century slave owner. On April 10, 1834, a fire broke out at the mansion at 1140 Royal Street in the French Quarter of New Orleans, Louisiana, where Madame Lalaurie lived. Its neighbors rushed to assist, offering to extinguish the flames and help evacuate the family. However, they quickly noticed something wrong. The lady of the house was trying to save her valuables without the aid of her slaves a sight unheard of in the southern elite standards of the 19th century. When asked about her slave's whereabouts, she dismissively told everyone to mind their own business. Suspicion grew, with some finding her behavior mysterious and others claiming to hear faint moans and screams from the attic. A group decided to investigate further and force their way into the house. When they opened the attic door, they were met with a horrifying scene that defied description. The stink alone was enough to make some vomit. They had stumbled upon the torture chamber of Madame Marie Delphine Lalaurie. She had a chamber filled with unimaginable horrors. It contained piles of corpses of following the discovery of this chamber of horrors. It became abundantly clear that the allegations regarding the disappearance of Lalaurie's slaves were horrifically accurate. Earlier, before everyone saw the real face of Madame Lalaurie, 
people were suspicious of her already. Hence, a local lawyer visited her mansion and reported a tragic incident involving a 12-year-old slave girl who fell to her death from the roof of the Royal Street Mansion while trying to escape punishment from a whip-wielding Lollary. The evil face of Madame Lollary finally came before the eyes of the world when her mansion caught fire and people witnessed how she tortured her black slaves. She used to satisfy her sadistic pleasures by torturing black slaves who were mostly black men peeling their skin off and taking their organs out. Did you know about the sexual relationships between elite white women slave owners and black male slaves? What do you think? Why don't the U.S. want you to know about this dark chapter of black history? Let us know your thoughts on this in the comment section right below. Would you like us to make more videos? If yes, please support us by subscribing to the Black History Archives and clicking the bell icon. You can check out more videos on our channel too.